speaking of shift, we're going to shift segments again on you, and we're going to welcome Linda Smith from Smith Inc. She is our storytelling segment chair. Come on out, Linda. Thank you, Lori. So good morning, almost lunchtime. Good news, right? So by now I'm sure you figured out that the theme of this conference is being disruptive. And so when I was asked to chair the storytelling segment, I wanted my segment to be disruptive. So I decided to invite three speakers to help me with storytelling that have never been to this conference. They haven't ever attended SAIT before. They're not members of the Themed Entertainment Association. And they really don't work in our theme park industry. So I wanted some outside perspective, I wanted to look at storytelling in a whole new way. So my um, segment, when I started organizing my ideas around storytelling, it was around being disruptive and storytelling unleashed. And so that's what my three topics will um, refer back to today, is think about this notion of storytelling unleashed. When Al Gore wrote An Inconvenient Truth, his motivation was to tell a story that unleashed social action, motivated action among people to combat uh, climate change. And despite the awards, the um, accolades he received, uh, despite the sales of his book, um, in his mind, um, he failed because he didn't motivate the action he was seeking through his storytelling. But you know, when you think about storytelling, what are we trying to do? We certainly, in many cases, are wanting to get more than hand claps. In some cases, we're hoping our audience will laugh. In other cases, we're eliciting a deeper emotion and a tear. But many of us in the storytelling world really are trying to affect action as well and to motivate change. And when you're a mission-driven organization, Affecting action, motivating your audience to take action, is probably the basis of your mission. Most mission-driven organizations tell their stories to affect change. They hope to empower people to take action. So today, speaking about the intersection of mission, storytelling, and hopefully unleashing action is Anna Musin Miller from the Indianapolis Zoo, and she is speaking to Social Action Unleashed. Come on out, Anna. <laughs> there you go. All right. I have the power of the clicker. It's dangerous. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm really enjoying my first SAID conference. Um, and as Linda mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it's like to tell stories when the object is changing people. Uh, if you have been anywhere near the internet in the last year, you may have noticed that the diagnosis of culture-wide pervasive apathy is wrong. In fact, there is a thing called the internet rage machine, um, and it's very active. People react to stories. Like, for example, the story of Cecil the Lion, who they had never heard of before a Facebook friend was angry about him. And the presence of that comment button lets me take action on my fight or flight response instantaneously. People are hungry for that action. They're hungry for meaning. You can see it in young people who are choosing jobs that offer more purpose than pay. You can see it in people standing up across the country against social injustice. Um, and that need for action is something that in the zoo industry we have been look ready for for a long time. And here should be a giraffe. There's, oh, there's the giraffe. Great. Um, so um, we as conservation organizations are in the business more or less of saving the world. And uh, storytelling is really key to making that happen. When you go to a zoo, what you're seeing are animals who are ambassadors. They're ambassadors for their wild counterpart 
and that gives you the opportunity to form an emotional connection that we hope then leads to some sort of conservation action. Stories are a straight line to a stranger's heart, um, more effective than anything else. Um, but when you have a cute animal, it helps too. So, we zoo people um, are driven by conservation stories. They boil our blood, they get us up in the morning, um, they get us out hand feeding red pandas, little tiny grapes. Um, so it should be really easy for us to go out and tell people these engaging, urgent stories and we'll just infect them with our passion and we'll go out and change the world, right? Well, there's something that other Cape Crusader types before us have figured out and that's that if a disaster is too gigantic, people feel impotent and they get depressed. Um, and if it's too distant, they can't bring themselves to have the energy to care about it. So it's our job to make conservation, which is big and global and scary, accessible, personal, and attainable. We used to think that it was enough to just make you fall in love with some gorgeous cheetahs, for example. These are Chiku and Jira, their eight-year-old cheetah sisters. They love steak tartare. <laughs> they love uh, incredible bursts of speed followed by incredible bursts of napping. We give you the opportunity to meet them, to find something that you have in common with them, the napping maybe, um, or something that you admire. Um, and then we hit you with an emotional sucker punch. Oh, so you care about cheetahs now? Well, that's great. Guess what? They're all dying. Don't you wish you could do something about it? Have a great day at the zoo. As you may have noticed, there's a slight flaw in this method. You've made me fall in love, and then you've made me personally responsible for the death of every cheetah everywhere. What a great experience that I'm in a hurry to repeat. Um, I'm definitely going to engage with you more. You seem like a real winner. Also, what am I supposed to do with that? You, there's nothing wrong with the idea of the love, care, action cycle. But you can't drop somebody into a story, tell them it's a disaster, and give them no tools to succeed. It's your job as a storyteller to convince people that not only are they the protagonist, but they actually have the power to succeed in a situation. So here's how we do that with cheetahs. Or beautiful lemurs. So you've just met Chiku and Jira. We have established that they are basically the coolest. I can't say raddest felines on the planet because I will get in trouble, but between you and me. Well, on the other side of the world, there's a woman named Lori Marker who loves cheetahs just as much as you love your new feline BFFs. And she discovered something when she was working in Namibia that cheetahs were coming into conflict with Namibian farmers. Much like American farmers tend to get a little uncomfortable when a coyote comes around, Namibian farmers saw cheetahs as a threat to their livelihoods. And cheetahs saw herds of livestock as a slow-moving, all-you-can-eat buffet. Tension, right? So Lori's job was to convince cheetahs that livestock snacks were actually a bad idea. So to save the cats, she sent in the dogs. Cheetah Conservation Fund, Lori's organization, started to breed Kangol shepherd dogs. These gigantic shepherd dogs um, are out of Eastern Europe. They're a breed that's used to protect sheep and goats from wolves. Intimidating. So they started to breed these dogs, they started to distribute them to Namibian farmers and explain, hey, if you put this big scary guy in your flock, cheetahs won't come around as much. And in fact, when cheetahs hear the bark that comes out of a 150 pound dog, um, they're suddenly more attracted to a gazelle with no bodyguard. 
So as fatalities of livestock due to cheetahs dropped, fatalities of cheetahs due to farmers dropped. A win-win, a great story. And at the zoo, we already give an annual donation to Cheetah Conservation Fund to fund that great work. So technically, by coming to the zoo, you've already made a contribution. Um, you've already done something for cheetah conservation in the wild. But if you've just made me fall in love, telling me I've already acted is a little emotionally hollow. So we give people the opportunity to act on that motivation when it's at its peak. Every year we raise over $10,000 in quarters uh, in the cheetah, race of cheetah experience. This gives guests the opportunity for only 50 cents to see if they will be the first of thousands to outrun a cheetah. <laughs> the cheetahs are currently winning. Um, but in more than one way. So people are able to run, it's fun, it's an accessible price point, they get to feel good about making a contribution, that's awesome. We get to send ten, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars a year, not in quarters, um, to Cheetah Conservation Fund. So it's a great story. We we tell you what's wrong with, with cheetahs in the wild, but we tell you a success story. We let you become part of the success story. We let you be Indiana Jones, right? But what happens to the kid who ran? He, he ran, he gave 50 cents, he felt really good about it, now he's more tired, he'll take a nap, his parents are happy, but what, what happens to him when he leaves our institution? It's, it's not enough just to have that one interaction. And if the whole point is to save the world uh, by fundamentally altering the way that our guests relate to the world around them, then success is a lot harder to measure than zeros on a check. But we're starting to try. The latest and greatest addition to the Indianapolis Zoo is the Simon Scott International Orangutan Center. This enormous orangutan playground gives orangutans the opportunity to move through tons of vertical space, sometimes over guests' heads. Nobody's been peed on yet, but thank you for asking, uh, as everyone does. It gives them the chance to make natural social choices. Orangutans like to hang out on their own, so we give them the opportunity to decide, do I want to spend time with that guy? Maybe not today. Um, I can go hang out by myself. And it also gives them tons of mental stimulation through, among other things, the use of touchscreen computers. It's an awesome place to be an orangutan, but ultimately the point is its effect on people. Orangutans will disappear from the wild in the next 20 years if orangutans' habitat in Borneo and Sumatra continues to be destroyed at the current rate. This will give them the unfortunate distinction of being the first great ape to go extinct in human history. Cheery. Uh, this exhibit gives people the opportunity to make eye contact with AZ, he's a charmer, and then make an actual contribution, buy trees to plant in Borneo, while you can still maintain that connection with a real animal. But that one-time contribution isn't going to be enough. If we're going to succeed at saving orangutans, which is the tall order, we need to fundamentally change the way that you experience the world. We need to change the way that you feel about orangutans in such a way that they become a presence in your life. And the way you make decisions changes. So after the exhibit opened, we conducted a summative evaluation, looking at how people were using the space and what messages they were taking away. I've done my fair share of being the creepy lady stalking you through museum exhibits, seeing where you go, and then asking you questions when you leave about what messages you took away. But here we wanted something more than that. We wanted something extra. 
the sign of success is that you have changed, that you are a different person now than when you entered the building. So how do I find that out? We ask people, okay, you finished your exhibit experience, Tell me how you felt about orangutans before. What about now? And can I ask you again in six to eight weeks? And this is what we found out. Hey, people leaving the exhibit are like, yeah, orangutans are rad. I feel so much better about orangutans now. Um, I, I, I feel really motivated. I feel like I can take action and, and I can make a difference in the lives of orangutans. It's going to be great. And that's awesome. That, that tells me that that moment when they're leaving the exhibit is so emotionally potent. It's so important to capture because I'm connected. I'm connected to this animal in a way that I will never be again. This is this prime, beautiful moment. But maybe more importantly, six to eight weeks later, people were still feeling more positive about orangutans, they're demonstrating a better attitude about orangutans than they did before the exhibit. So we know that, hey, the intensity of the attitude may decrease over time, but people's openness to action sticks with them. They might forget what they read on a sign, how old Daisy is, how much he weighs, but people don't forget how they felt. So what do we do with that? It's like suddenly realizing that you're irradiated and you can lift cars with a single finger, right? So we, we have this superpower. We can change people's emotions and it stays. So what, what ethical questions do we need to be asking ourselves if we know that we have that power? What do we need to do to continue to grab people after they leave our physical site? Particularly for zoos, for whom that immediacy of a real animal right in front of me is such a powerful emotional tool. So, the challenge of conservation, the joy of conservation, is that we're always in the middle of the story. Every success, tells us to try harder, to be better, to inspire more people, to be more empowering, because there's always more world to save. It's infuriating, and it's what drives us. So how are your stories pushing you? In a society of people hungry for action, what can they inspire or ignite? or instigate? How are they infuriating you? You already know that they're powerful. What are you going to do with them? Thanks. Yeah.